Do those who hatch this foolish cry of communism in the CIO fear the increased influence of labor in our democracy? Do they fear its influence will be cast on the side of shorter hours, a better system of distributed employment, better homes for the underprivileged, social security for the aged, a fair distribution of our national income? These are pretty good questions that he's asking uh, in this rhetorical way because he is suggesting that um, those who raise the cry of communism feel what toward all of these things he's just listed? I mean, whether it's fair or not, it, what is he suggesting about their attitude to these things? That yeah, that they don't want them at all. They fear them. It's a pretty good way to put it, though. In other words, he's saying, do they fear a better system of employment, better homes for the underprivileged, social security, fair distribution of our national income? In other words, by asking these questions, he's essentially saying that seems to be what they do fear. That seems to be what the fear is. Certainly, labor wants a fairer share of the national income. Labor has suffered just as our farm population has suffered from a viciously unequal distribution of the national income. National income and national wealth was unequally distributed at this time. It is still unequally distributed. It is more unequally distributed now than it has been for quite a long time. Um, you talk with people in economics. I teach a course with Ben Friedman in economics. The chances of your moving from the bottom percent, bottom 20 percent to the top 20 percent of the income ladder is the same today as it was 30 years ago, believe it or not. But the distance between the rungs on that ladder is greater. Now, does everyone understand that concept? In other words, you have as much chance percentage-wise moving from the bottom of income and wealth to the top as you did ever since World War II in the United States. So that's the good news. But the bad news is, is that the distance between those ranks has grown greater and greater. So if your chance of moving from the bottom to the middle is exactly the same, but the middle is quite a bit higher than the bottom, and the top is a lot higher than it used to be, that means you are expanding the range of inequality. You haven't actually decreased the chance of mobility, but you have expanded the range of inequality itself. Everyone got that concept? So that's why we're st still talking about it today. Because the inequality has grown in terms of income and wealth, even though if someone says, oh, there's just as much chance of a person who's not poor becoming rich today as there was 30 years ago. Yes, statistically, that's true. But that chance isn't very great. For example, to move from the bottom quintile to the top quintile, it's been estimated that the chance is maybe 6 to 10%, no more. That's not a very high percentage. But the distance between the top and the bottom now is greater than it was 30 or 40 years ago. That's where the inequality really pinches. That means you have a more unequal society because the rich are richer than the middle class than they used to be, and the middle class better off than those who are impoverished than 30 years ago. So Lewis goes on to talk about peaceful negotiations and contractual relationships. And then, this is on 114 near the top, until an aroused public opinion demands that employers accept that rule, labor has no recourse but to surrender its rights or struggle for their realization with its own economic power. So he's calling on labor and the labor movement to use its might. Now, what would it mean to use its own economic power? What would be the economic power of labor? Power to strike. Yes, that's number one, the power to strike. Even if you can bring in strike breakers, is a company liable to lose money if workers go on strike? Yes, it is liable to lose money. Are the workers liable to lose money? Yes, they're liable to lose money too. The union will set aside a certain amount of money to help the workers, but that money doesn't last forever. So right now in the state of Massachusetts, we are experiencing a strike of what significant group of workers? Anyone know? Is it nurses? No, that that nurses, no, no, I don't think so. 
I don't think nurses in general, there's an important ballot question on nurses up in the November ballot, but I don't think nurses are currently on strike throughout much of Massachusetts. Oh, wait, is it bus drivers? No. Mm -hmm. Anybody? Natural gas workers. Natural gas workers, the people who go out and fix the pipelines, and their jobs are being substituted by others in natural gas. Do you know what happened up in Lowell and Lawrence recently and all that overpressure of the gas pipes and thousands of people thrown out of their homes? And it, it's a terrible thing. We live in a bubble here, but you know, there were tens of thousands of people inconvenienced by this. There were explosions and fires just about 15, 20 miles from here because all the gas lines were overpressured. Now, no suggestion that that was because competent workers were on strike, but it didn't help that they were on strike when this happened because now the gas company has to call in other workers from other places to do that work. So what is happening in these speeches by Schneiderman and by Lewis is a call for labor to organize, to uh, create a solidarity, to change the lives because the law is not on their side, particularly, and in fact the law is very often against them in some instances, and the public has not acted sufficiently to force policy and the politicians to take action. So what are you left with? You're left with turning to your fellow worker, your sister worker, your brother worker, and saying, we have got to do something. It's like the old Japanese proverb, one stick alone can be broken easily. Many sticks bound together are hard to break. And that is really what organized labor in the United States was in the earlier mid 20th century. And it affected the lives of a huge number of people, very often in a very positive way. We don't talk as much about organized labor today because it isn't as prevalent. We live in a more fluid economy. People generally don't hold jobs for as long as they once did. They change jobs more often. They move more often than they used to. There are all kinds of reasons. Yet there are still very powerful and large unions in the United States. And there are still important unions of uh, government workers in many states and um, cities and towns. So all of these issues are ones that we're still very much so living with. I handed out an outline today. Do everyone have that two-page outline? I am not going to bore you by reading this outline verbatim. It would be nonsensical for me to do so. You can read it yourself. It's a summary, not a substitute for, a summary of what is in classical rhetoric for the modern student about the different parts of a discourse. And the reason I wrote it out is that I wanted to emphasize certain things that are perhaps mentioned in Corbett, but not stressed a lot. So that's why I give you this complete two-page outline. And I just want to mention one or two simple things here. Keep introductions short, period. Don't try to be funny or melodramatic unless you're really good at it. Do you ever see somebody doing stand-up comedy who's no good at it? It's painful. <laughs> Similarly, in a speech, narration. Don't make your narration so long that your audience forgets what your argument is. You should have already stated your argument briefly, briefly, or implied it. <laughs> You got a long narration, oh, people are gonna lose track of what you're arguing. Well, that fact's interesting, this is interesting, that chronology is interesting. What's the point? Why am I being told these things? That's the question that will enter your reader's mind. So keep that narration succinct. You remember what Lincoln does in the House Divided speech? This happened, then this happened, then this happened. Boom, 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 boom. The first point, the second point, the third point. It secured this, it secured that. It's, it's really like a legal brief. That's, that was a fairly long narration there because it was a fairly complex story. But he kept in mind the argument by stating the argument briefly at the beginning. Nation's gonna be all slave or all free. Now let's find out why, give you the narration. The, your argument may have some parts to it, right? In other words, you may have 
some evidence and some different points to make in support of your argument, multiple points. These are what used to be called in rhetoric the partitions of an argument. Now all that means, what does partition mean? It means just divisions. That's all it means. It's not a term that I'm going to use in this class, but if you run across it, that's what it means. Then there arises this question. When you're putting forward the various points of your argument, in other words, you're adducing different things in support of it, do you put the most important first or last? Hmm, Noor says last. What's the danger, Noor, of putting it last? Use your imagination. What would be the danger of putting it last? But if the audience gets tired? So yeah, of your audience is waiting, and you've started off with a weaker reason, and your audience thinks, boy, is that all she's got? If you build up to it and you let your audience know you're going to build up to it, that's another matter. But this is a tricky decision that everyone's going to have to make in their arguments. Do you put the most important thing last? And I would suggest make a considered judgment about that. Because if you start off with a couple of weak reasons, you're either going to lose your audience or they're going to say, oh, come on. Or, worse yet, they might anticipate you, and they might start thinking of what your strongest argument is before you express it. And what would that make your audience think? I'm quicker than he or she is. I, I got this down faster. And you don't want your audience to do that, because they will get impatient, quite understandably. You could experiment with strong, a couple of weaker things, and then a fairly strong, whatever. But if you have different parts, don't necessarily keep your powder dry until the end, because by that time, people are going to wonder. If, on the other hand, you have a case to make that obviously builds up to a stronger and stronger series of points, then, you, then Noor's advice is good advice. Save the strongest part of the argument to the last, because it will be clear to your readers that there is a crescendo. But it's perhaps treacherous, unless that's obvious. Rebuttal? Has people been including rebuttals in their short essays, thinking about rebuttals? It's important, I think, uh, and often overlooked. And it's important in academic writing, not just in public writing. Uh, you're making an academic argument or an interpretation, you should, you will, I guarantee you will get a better grade on your senior thesis or junior paper or any long research paper if you are able, in a rebuttal, to put something forward strongly in opposition to your argument and then give that the kibosh. You will do better. It's a one-two punch. Say, here's my argument, here's the argument against me, and here's the argument against the argument against me. Case closed. If you don't do that, you leave yourself open. Anybody here fence? Anybody here on the fencing team? Katie, oh, but you have fenced. I have fenced. And anybody here done wrestling? Anybody wrestler here? OK. So fencers and wrestlers. There are various moves you can make in fencing, right? There are various moves you can make in wrestling, right? Does every move invite a counter move? Yes. And what happens if you don't know or aren't expecting that counter move? You're toast, right? You're toast, yeah. You're toast, yeah. Touch, touch. Or you get pinned. <laughs> so that's the analogy with your argument and a counter argument. You got to know it's coming. You have to think of it. And you have to be ready for it, and you have to rebut it. If you know what every counter move is now in fencing, it's really fast, isn't it? Right? So you've got to practice and practice. But you who are writing or speaking have the leisure to sit and think, what is the worst that can be brought against my position? This is not easy, because you may be an impassioned individual arguing strenuously for something that you believe in. It may be actually very hard for you to conjure up a strong argument against yourself because you find it so distasteful 
and so unlikely. Or to put it bluntly, ladies and gentlemen, you just may be prejudiced. You just may be a prejudiced person on this point. We all are prejudiced on some points. So self-examination here will help you construct the best counter-argument. And maybe it might even make you change your argument a little. Peroration, I use the term peroration rather than conclusion. Because everyone should, after they have written their conclusion, look at every sentence in that conclusion and say, should not this sentence come earlier? Should not it perhaps come near the introduction or at the head of the argument? If you are doing your best to sum up what your argument is in your conclusion, you've done it too late. You have waited to the very end for the highest nutritional value. The peroration should be more like a kind of dessert. It should perhaps elevate emotion and feeling a little. It should resonate. It should change its tone from that of direct argument. Could even inspire in some cases. But what it should not do is state your argument that you should have stated earlier as a, quote, conclusion, end quote. That's why I don't like the word conclusion. Because it suggests, what am I concluding in this paper? What you are concluding in your paper is your argument, which needs to come earlier. So look at every single sentence near the end of your paper and ask, maybe this sentence should go earlier, maybe much earlier. Should it? And I bet you will discover very often that it should. <laughs>